to me great pleasure to introduce another keynote speaker, uh, Deputy Commissioner Peter Martin. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Peter Martin uh, joined the Queensland Police Service in 1980 and 36 years later, this year, he was promoted to Deputy Commissioner, uh, which is a fantastic result. Uh, many of you would know, and some of you may not know, that he's also an adjunct professor at the University of Queensland. In 2015, he was appointed as the Griffith University Arts, Education and Law Alumnus of the Year. And he is the founding chair of the Australia and New Zealand Society of Evidence-Based Policing. I don't know what you do in your spare time, Deputy Commissioner, but uh, there must be precious little spare time. Uh, Dr Martin was awarded the Australian Police Medal on Australia Day 2008 for his contribution to policing and has a number of other awards and recognitions for his commitment to policing and the community. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Deputy Commissioner Peter Martin. Well, Mark, thanks very much for that uh, very, very kind, uh, overly generous uh, introduction. And you've confirmed the fact that um, something I've held for a very long time uh, and let me state it right here to anybody that's prepared to listen, you are the best MC here today. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a couple of acknowledgements uh, that have already been uh, mentioned before, but I would uh, particularly like to acknowledge you, Mark, as the MC today. I'd like to acknowledge my Commissioner, Commissioner Ian Stewart. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Dr Rick Brown uh, from the AIC. Rick, it's wonderful that we could partner with you with uh, respect to this very, very important initiative. To all of the senior officers that are in the room, to my police colleagues from across Australasia, and in fact globally, to all academics, researchers, uh, and friends to science, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, importantly, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of which we meet, and I acknowledge their, uh, the ancestors, past and present. I'm very grateful to the conference organisers to be able to present on something that not only is incredibly important, but it is something that I'm incredibly passionate about, and that's evidence-based policing. And importantly, um, I'd like to uh, thank and acknowledge the Australian Institute of Policing, uh, sorry, Institute of Criminology for partnering with the Queensland Police Service, or better still, us partnering with them to facilitate what I know will be a very, very worthwhile uh, conference. Before the conference today, I was met by a, um, a senior research colleague who said to me, I love coming to police conferences. And I thought, it's got to be the scintillating um, topic of conversation. It's got to be the quality of the presenters. But she followed that up very, very quickly by saying, the good thing about police conferences is, one, they're always on time, and secondly, the meals are always great. <laughs> so I'm assuming that there's also some content there that uh, they find uh, incredibly appealing also. Let me just see if I can advance this slide. Ah, when all else fails, turn it on. Did you ever wonder how the medical profession got to where it is today? I, I often think about this, and I think about allied fields to policing. And I ask myself the question, why are they positioned today and what was their evolutionary process? You may, as I have done over successive years, thought about that. Um, I regard myself as incredibly fortunate that I live in the times that we, we live in, where I have knowledge about nutrition, the availability of those things that sustain my life and which are correlated with positive health outcomes. If something deleterious was to happen to my health, to me or my family, to a great degree of confidence, I know that I can seek medical treatment from a health professional, or at least that is true in a first world country. The health professional that I go to is most probably, with all uh, degree of certainty, um, availed of the best, most scientific, rigorously evaluated methods with respect to the sorts of things that I need to otherwise make me well. But the field of medicine has not always been like this. Quackery, mysticism, utilisation of leeches, bloodletting techniques, the application of herbal poultices and a host of other remedies were once the norm. They were commonly accepted and in fact expected of the customer. Negative outcomes or death were regarded as being the will of God and not the fault of the dispenser of the, uh, the practice. But there were those brave souls, those early adopters of 
medical science, those that question the prevailing norm that I think we really do need to at least turn our mind to. Two really quick examples, and there are hundreds of these. Florence Nightingale, who many of you would know as the Lady of the Lamp, the angel of the Crimea toward the latter part of the 18th century. Sorry, the, late, uh, the latter part of the uh, um, uh, 1860s. Wrote a treatise on nursing entitled Notes on Nursing, What It Is and What It's Not. And she started to document those practices that she identified were otherwise consistent with good and positive health outcomes. One strategy in particular um, caused her to take note and to otherwise uh, write about it in terms of very positive outcomes for patients. And that was a matter as simply as something that we would find laughable today. And that was the sanitary practice of getting doctors to wash their hands. And while she may not have been able to speak about the complexities associated with microbiology, pathogens being transferred from a patient to a doctor, a doctor to a patient, fundamentally that one initiative saw the rates of infection in the hospital that she was attached to diminish fairly significantly and see health outcomes for patients rise quite exponentially. To the extent that of all the field hospitals across the Crimea conflict, the health outcomes in her hospital were well and above those of others. Dr John Snow, a London obstetrician, who believed that cholera could possibly be formed by something other than the miasma theory. You all know the miasma theory, the principle that, in fact, cholera is not formed by waterborne pathogens, but, in fact, um, cholera was a manifestation of uh, foul air vapours. And, of course, London of the mid-1800s, late-1800s, there was no shortage of those foul vapours. And it wasn't until um, in the London East End there was a particular well in which a mother had washed... I'm sorry for those of you that have had breakfast, but in any, in any event, a mother had washed a diaper of a child in a well that led to the death of 616 people directly related to that water source that led to people starting to think that snow might very well be onto something. The removal of one pump, one pump handle, in the Broad Street area of East London led to a very significant decrease um, with respect to cholera in that area. Uh, and it was identified that Snow's theory that cholera was formed by waterborne pathogens was in fact accepted over a period of time, that there was a spatial link to cholera that was occurring with respect to a pump in a particular area around that particular locale in East London. And I think that what we need to do is we need to keep cognizant of the fact that medicine just hasn't materialised to where it is today, but it had an evolutionary journey and it required brave souls, those early people, that went against the prevailing norm to identify uh, that there was a different way of doing business or alternatively a different um, theory or hypothesis that could be wrapped around those things that police often do. So how did the medical profession get to the point that it is today? How did it get to the point where it uses science predominantly to guide its practice, otherwise referred to as evidence? So then what is the policing relationship with science or evidence? And I'm not necessarily talking here about forensic science, but I'm talking about the notion of science being a much, much more broader concept. So what is evidence-based policing? Well, it may mean different things to different people and there are various definitions, but the definition that I subscribe to, or at least I identify with, is the definition that's proposed by Sherman. Larry Sherman says that evidence-based policing is a method of making decisions about what works in policing, which practices and strategies accomplish police missions most cost-effectively. In contrast, to basing decisions on theory, assumptions, traditions or conventions. An evidence-based approach continually tests hypothesis with empirical research findings. And if any occupation is primed to take advantage of science, it's policing, because police understand the connection between cause and effect. They're pragmatic. They want to ensure that what they're doing is efficient, that they're not wasteful. And that's that pragmatism that comes to play. They understand the need to justify their activity. Yet why has policing come to science so late uh, as a guiding philosophy? I might just leave that hang there for a moment and talk about that in just a moment. But if we look at the complexity of today, um, leading an evidence-based police agency is much, much easier said than done. And the complexity of policing, police leaders of today face rapid changes in society that arise as a result of myriad issues. And some of these issues are um, documented here. Competing demands for resources, competing priorities, 
changes of policy direction, economic and social factors impacting communities. The Commissioner, um, uh, Ian Stewart, has already spoken about the technological related issues, issues of terrorism, organised crime, community demands, community engagement, not least of which is the political expectations. And of course, there's many more. And against the backdrop of the change, there are those that suggest that police leaders now, more than ever before, need greater connectivity to global issues, creativity, adaptability, strong communication skills and a sound understanding of criminological theory and research methods. Leading Wisebud and Nehru back in 2011 to state that it's now time for police to own their own science. And owning the science of policing is a major challenge for police executives all over the world. For many police agencies and their leaders, the rhetoric of being evidence-based far outstrips the reality. So there's a couple of fundamental questions for me that I'll attempt to address uh, in this very short presentation. And these are some of the key issues. So what does it take for a police organisation to be evidence-based? And how do police organisations move from that rhetoric of using evidence to guide practice to inculcating that philosophy in the very DNA of their organisations? I'll speak to the paucity of research that currently exists or doesn't exist, and I'll identify strategies to fast-track the research agenda applicable to policing. <clears throat> As I've already stated, enshrining evidence-based policing into every facet of the police agency is and will remain a significant challenge. Through the provision of dedicated funding, strong and effective strategic leadership and training and mentoring, the next generation of officers with an understanding of and commitment to science, police agencies have the greatest chance of success in making their organisations truly evidence-based. Evidence-based police leaders need to take responsibility for training the next generation of police personnel to run their in-house experimental evaluations as a matter of routine policy. And this is consistent with the wise but Nehru philosophy of owning the science of their profession. Yet the sheer magnitude of undertaking in-house experiments, coupled with the lack of in-house capabilities, are barriers to success. Police leaders therefore need to prioritise areas for evaluation and use a range of academy-based and university and online approaches to build the internal critical mass to assess routine practice. Many police leaders, however, don't know what they don't know. And at the present time, there exists what I describe as an asymmetrical knowledge situation existing. And by this, I mean that police have the knowledge of what they currently do, and academics know the method best suited to test different practices. But often, the twain do not talk. Senior police need to be more scientific-like and understand what scientific rigour can bring to police practice. And importantly, for academics, an opportunity exists to have greater focus on translational science. This means rather than satisfying internal KPI, key performance indicator, of producing a research article, perhaps partnering to implement their research should be a higher, or at least of equal, order accomplishment. And I'm pleased to see there's some significant change in that regard. There are some very good examples where the QPS has partnered with a range of institutions very much locally uh, here in the southeast corner of Queensland, such as the University of Queensland and also Griffith University in these terms. And I don't know that that would have occurred to the same degree as recently as 10 years ago. But changing the paradigm of policing to see evaluation as a necessary and mainstream part of policing is a key challenge. But what good is it if individuals recognise this but have no ability to affect it? It's unlikely that simply buying in research capability will solve this problem for a range of reasons. And nor would this lead necessarily to prodig pro uh, prodigious research outcomes for law enforcement. Instead, police agencies need to build and own their own science. And one of the important tools in that is to otherwise start to build this into recruit training as an important element of police leadership. And fortunately, there's some very positive and progressive work being done in that area in Queensland, which is very exciting. A key risk and opportunity is the role of the first tier supervisor or middle level manager within police agencies. They're often a significant challenge. They can, not always naturally enough, but serve as a roadblock to implementation of change within police organisations and any strategy in terms of building in um, evidence-based 
practice as a guiding philosophy within police organisations needs to have a specific strategy to deal with this important issue. Increasingly, police agencies are being held to account for their performance. And although outcomes of police activity have routinely been published in statistical reviews and annual reports, the publication of data about expenditure and performance fortunately are now more commonplace, notwithstanding operational sensitivities. But what is less understood, however, is the process by which police achieve results and the nature of the activity employed. And these are often complex and intricate considerations, the exclusive domain of the police agency. But police agencies have an obligation to engage the community, to explain their performance and their outputs, not only the outcomes, but also the methods by which these outcomes are achieved. And police should be held accountable for the ways in which they utilise public funds. This is a responsibility not just of the police agency, but of course of all units of public administration or government departments. And conversely, the citizenry have a role to play in a healthy society, one in which the rule of law is applied fairly, to ensure that police resources are being used appropriately in fair and reasonable ways that benefit the community. Yet at present, the community tends not to appreciate that much of what police do globally, universally, has rigorous scientific um, uh, evaluative methods wrapped around it. From my perspective, I see that there are a number of key roles for police leaders in fostering evidence-based policy reform. These are, at least to my mind, to acknowledge the paucity of the evidence at least as a starting point, to allocate sufficient discretionary funding to support in-house evaluations, to train the next generation of staff to run um, in-house evaluations, converse, uh, conversing with ministers and engaging in a conversation across government um, and at government agencies about resource allocations, and importantly, importantly, as much as it pains us mothballing age-old police practices that don't work or at worst, do harm. And police leaders contributing to the discourse which demands evidence. Building a mature organisation that possesses the internal capabilities to assess under field trial conditions their own policies and practice requires police leaders to not only fund but to support for activities. At least to my mind, they are uh, the knowledge and the skill will have to be developed within the workforce. And secondly, opportunities need to be created for individuals to exercise the newfound knowledge and skills by actually undertaking evaluations. Thirdly, senior officers and others within the organisation identified as the knowledgeable or early adopters of evidence will need to mentor those individuals who are developing their knowledge and skills. And lastly, police leaders need to provide organisational support and recognition to individuals uh, who subscribe and commit to building and integrating evidence-based practice um, into every facet of policing. One aspect of public administration that has current universality is the pressure and competition on public assets, particularly finances. Naturally enough, the public purse is incredibly finite and there is significant competition across government for the scarce resources that are available. Governments investing in one domain or in one government department do so at the expense of another, and in economics, that's referred to as the opportunity cost. The sorts of things that I'm talking about are going to be incredibly important. They're important now, and they're going to be incredibly important to the future, where activity is going to be related even more closely to funding, and importantly, and importantly that activity will not be funded unless there's rigorous evaluative methods wrapped around it. So to take this a little further, specific activities within a government portfolio or a department are supported through funding. Key performance indicators are established and performance is monitored and rewarded through continued funding. Therefore, the activity supported by government must create value. And increasingly, government is concerned around a number of questions. Does the activity create public value? Does the activity work? How do we know that the strategy works and is the strategy effective? Any government department which is unable to answer these questions is incredibly vulnerable and their activity is in an incredibly vulnerable position in terms of future funding. And no longer can enterprises like health, education, but importantly police be seen as the funding sacred cows, where there's an envelope of funding infinitum that um, ultimately props up the activity of the enterprise. 
One reason that there's not been a greater historical focus on building and evidence bases in policing is because it hasn't been demanded. That's not to blame government for the lack of attention to this regard, but it's the fact that um, often what get measured gets done and what is conditional on funding will ultimately be given uh, greater priority. There's a diversity of views concerning the best and most prodigious evaluative methods. And often academics and uh, other stakeholders claim that randomised control trials and quasi-experimental approaches are the best ways of establishing cause and effect. And I think certainly from a policing organisation we need to be really clear that there is an opportunity to facilitate costly and complex randomised control trials, but not every issue we grapple with needs to be looked at within the context of the complexity of a methodology such as that. So it's the right approach for the right um, issue, but otherwise, whatever we do in that regard, to try to answer those reasonably important and fundamental questions about performance are incredibly important, particularly with respect to downstream funding. But fortunately, fortunately, in terms of using the existing research and bearing in mind that there's my, my fundamental proposition and those of others that I've cited, um, say that there is um, great opportunity there for much, much more research and certainly the proposition about the paucity of research is absolutely so. But there are some significant tools there that currently exist that enable us to mine that, uh, that data and that, uh, that information. And I bring your attention to a couple there, the LUM COPA matrix. And uh, Rick, uh, earlier in his address, spoke about some of these, uh, these tools and strategies. The LUM COPA matrix, the What Works for Crime Prevention tool, pit, tool Kit, the Crime Solutions in the US uh, website, the Global Policing Database and the UK, College, uh, UK Policing Co College tools are particularly useful and they're not by um, any stretch the only tools that exist to enable us to ultimately identify and use the prevailing um, research that currently exists. But I bring their, uh, their attention to you as important starting points with respect to um, promulgating uh, the research that current, uh, currently exists. And there's plenty of scope to do more of that in the future. But currently there's little internal or external impetus existing for police leaders to consult the evidence base that currently exists in order to make their important policy decisions. Given that police budgets in larger police jurisdictions now run into the many billions of dollars US, this is something that is changing now and it's something that will change fairly rapidly into the, into the future. So I, I think it's also important to just stop and take stock and look at the current literature uh, that actually looks at the factors which contribute to police in the past failing to use the research that currently exists. And ask ourselves, are these things so, and are they still so, and what have we got to do to change them? So some of the things that routinely come uh, to the fore in the literature, uh, the factors often cited include that police harbour a distrust for research and researchers. They rely on and are comfortable relying upon the craft of policing and officer intuition rather than fostering a desire to evaluate current practices. They fail to institutionalise organisational requirements of senior officers to ensure that they make decisions based on the best um, evidence. That they perceive the existence of cultural impediments to change as significant, which require enormous investments to overcome. They recognise that many government priorities are equally devoid of evidence yet understand that they have limited opportunity to speak out against poorly conceived law and order policies and, that, and they are unable to drive government organisational and community demands for, for policing efficiency and lack uh, extraneous incentives to innovate and enhance performance. So overall police leaders, if these things are so, um, often possess a blind spot when it comes to acknowledging the data scientific evidence available. And in private, unguarded moments, Many police leaders might readily agree that they lack sound policy evidence, but the myriad of factors that influence the day-to-day -day things that push and pull them and constrain them ultimately um, push them in a direction of doing what they have always done. But there are some significant and positive changes in, in that direction. As Mark uh, introduced, one of my uh, extraneous roles as the Foundation Chair of the Australian New Zealand Society of Evidence-Based Policing. 
And the establishment of the society is, I contend, a central enabling platform for embedding research into police organisations. In a number of countries now, the Australia and New Zealand, um, um, such as Australia and New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Canada, the US, Hong Kong and China, the creation of such societies that uh, I'll collectively refer to as societies of evidence-based policing have sprung up specifically to bring together people with mutual interest and to promulgate um, research. Uh, the goals of the society are clearly there. The British Society was uh, first established. The Australian New Zealand Society of Evidence-Based Policing was the second to form globally and uh, as a result of uh, the work that we've done now over this, uh, uh, approximately three plus years, we now have in the order of something in the order of 2,000 or so members. Um, and this is an attempt, a real attempt for police to take responsibility for, the, uh, for their own um, science of their profession. Um, all of you in this room, the 291 of you in this room, qualify for membership. Uh, for those of you that aren't, um, you heard it here first as a special offer to you. Um, I'm going to reduce the membership uh, by half, 50%. When you get online, uh, the website was previously put up. Please mention my name, we'll charge you half. It's probably also a good time to tell you that membership has always been free. But um, you, you, you heard it here first. That's the sort of guy I am. I mentioned before, this is not a, all doom and gloom and uh, you know, there's some very, very positive moves being, um, being made in this uh, incredibly important area. But also from my perspective, I think there are things that we can really do um, to um, fast track what has been occurring and what will inevitably occur anyway. So this is my 10 point plan and every plan should be preceded by the words cunning. I, I hold the view. So this is my cunning 10 point plan of how I think that we can actually fast track what will be an inevitability, I think, in law enforcement in the same way that it was in, in medicine. So the first issue for me is the development of a service-wide integrated strategy focusing on creating and managing knowledge. The second one is implementation of an evidence-based policing unit with broad capabilities. And importantly, there's a range of different ways that that's been operationalised, both here in Queensland and Western Australia. I know there's people here from Western Australia, but the work that they're doing in Western Australia is incredibly impressive in this space. And I'd recommend that you, um, you know, in the course of the next two days, consult with uh, your colleagues from Western Australia, please. Embedding a uh, criminology trained people in the evidence-based policing unit that I previously spoke about, even uh, putting in place a director of criminology, would be a very, very useful consideration. Uh, professionally development of uh, senior leaders to enlighten them on evidence-based policing um, is a key uh, consideration. And holding senior leaders accountable through performance management and set KPIs for creating new knowledge Implementing evaluative approaches and utilisation of existing best practice approaches is incredibly important also. But there's other things such as recruit training, building the next generation understanding and sympathetic to evidence-based policing. And I've made mention of the fact we're doing some impressive work at the Queensland Police Academy around this issue. Um, a specific strategy for the middle level managers, and I spoke about those people before as being incredibly important as custodians of organisational culture and values uh, if we want to move this issue forward. Better utilisation and dissemination of the existing research to, to start with is incredibly important, to recognise that research that exists and to utilise the research that currently is available. I spoke about some of the tools to do that. But importantly, this is not going to occur if it's not for the commitment of organisational funding the provision of a proportion of discretionary budgets to make this happen. And importantly, rewarding those people that I'd previously spoken about, um, the early adopters uh, to evidence-based policing as um, rewarding the work that they're doing as being um, incredibly important. So if we do all that, if we do all that, what are we gonna get? Well, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a greater focus on research and a better understanding and utilization. We're going to mainstream this into uh, the police functioning to a greater degree than we've done so in the past. We're going to see a next generation who are trained and committed and ready to challenge the prevailing thinking and leaders who are engaged, committed and well respected by the workforce. I think we're also likely to see better and more defensible business and government investment decisions and an organisation focused on efficiency and at very least not doing any harm. 
I think there might be time for a very quick vignette. Uh, this won't take long. But recently, uh, we've had a recruit join us at the Oxley Police Academy. This recruit happens to be, in a previous life, a cardiac sonographer. Um, she would spend her day in a darkened room conducting imagery of the heart and the vascular system that supports the, uh, the heart and the mechanisms. As she's doing her recruit training, she was exposed to a presentation recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, by an external um, uh, uh, presenter on the virtues of evidence-based policing and using science to guide the practice of policing into the future. When I spoke to her about how she found that, she said, well, isn't that interesting? She said, because prior to joining the police, everything that I did in terms of uh, CT imaging um, involved um, an evidence basis. My practice, the techniques, everything that I did um, was evidence-based. She said, but now that I've been exposed to um, evidence-based policing, she said, it's really quite remarkable because I've never thought of policing in those terms. I've never thought that science could inform and shape what it is we do. And importantly, now that I've been exposed to it, um, I don't know that I can think of policing in any other terms. But she spoke about it in terms of that it was important, that it was interesting and fascinating and incredibly exciting. And I think that not every recruit will share that experience, but I think that there's something really positive here that we're tapping into. And I think that there's something inherently optimistic about the next generation of people that are coming to policing, that want to look at different ways of doing business, that are prepared to take a fresh and innovative and creative approach. And I think that that augurs well for us, and I think we can leverage off that to very, very good effect. I'm going to conclude now, but let me just say that leading an evidence-based police agency of the future will present significant challenges. Police leaders need to be multi-dimensional, multi-faceted, with broad skills and myriad dimensions. These leaders will need to be both um, informed about evaluative methods and be able to engage with the community, including politicians, on not only what they're doing, but how they're doing it. They will need to know what works and what doesn't, and more importantly, how to apply resources to what is described in public policy as the wicked problems in ways that do not just protect people and property, but do so in really efficient ways. The police leader of the future will not only need to be committed to building and owning the science of their profession, but will also be responsible for the implementation and articulation of new knowledge into the business as usual practice of their agency. These early adopters of research will be required to champion change, commit to research, but mainstream evaluative examinations of their enterprise as the new norm. This will require different skills and new individual and organisational knowledge, and organisational knowledge that doesn't necessarily exist at the present, but poses significant challenges and opportunities for future leaders, particularly when their personal uh, knowledge and commitment of evaluative methods has not yet reached maturity. A key challenge for police leaders is to have clarity over the role of the police organisation and a very clear pathway to institutionalising evidence-based policing. The current generation of police leaders could, could be the last generation not to use evidence to guide practice universally. And that would be a very good thing. It would be a good thing for policing, it would be a good thing for government, and it would be a great thing for the citizenry that we're sworn to um, serve and protect. But it's not going to happen by accident. And the incremental movements forward are not going to get us to where we need to get to any time soon. It'll require cultural change, it'll require hard work, it'll require risk acceptance, and it'll require investment. With these things, we can reimagine a new future of policing. And as I've argued, I'm sure it's going to happen anyway, whether we like it or not. But what I'm talking here about making those fast quantum leaps forward as opposed to proceeding with glacial pace, as we're probably proceeding at the present time. Thank you.